disconnected from a strange voice coming out of your computer. But I'm hoping that I will be able to keep you occupied for the next hour and interested in the subject, health like safety. I am a senior partner for Park Health and Safety Partnership. I am also an occupational hygienist. Now, when I tell people I'm an occupational hygienist, they ask me two questions. Is it something to do with teeth or is it something to do with cleaning? Occupational hygiene is neither of those things. It's the science behind occupational health. And in part of this presentation, I'll be able to tell you a little bit more about what we as occupational hygienists do. Park Health and Safety Partnership um, began its life on the London 2012 project. Um, we became involved in the strategy behind occupational health and making health work in the same way that safety does in construction. We've used that same strategy and refined it across many other projects in construction, some large projects like the Tideway Tunnel and Battersea Power Station and Crossrail, some smaller projects, some smaller construction projects, and also some um, outside uh, agencies, energy agencies, the food industry, things like that. So the strategy that I'll be talking about is something that is well-founded in several industries now. First, we're going to talk about the unique challenge of health. What do I mean by that? Dealing with occupational health is a challenge for all of us. Um, worldwide, if you look at some of the problems that people have in their work, we kill more than 2 million people every year from the work that they do. That's across the world. And these statistics um, are from uh, quite old now, I think from about 2005. So it's probably more than 2 million deaths per year internationally. Um, what's interesting is if you look at the pie chart in front of you, of the people that die through their work, only 19% of them die due to accidents and violence, or if you like, the safety of health and safety. The rest of those people are dying something to do with occupational health or their health in general during their work. So it's important for us to be dealing with health issues. We could think that internationally there are lots of problems with health. So maybe it's better for us if we are in the UK or if we're in Europe because we've got better ways of dealing with health than perhaps uh, third world countries. But if we look at UK statistics, we still see a very similar split. So 2 million people suffer work-related ill health last year. If we look at the days lost to all industries, you're looking at 28.2 million working days lost. Again, look at the split in the pie chart there. Only 4.7 of them due to the safety part of health and safety. The majority of those people, or those days lost, are lost due to ill health. It accounts for 46% of health and safety incidents, 83% of sickness, and 99% of work-related deaths every year. So we really need to be paying attention to the health part of health and safety from a moral perspective, but also from an economic perspective. We are talking about the construction industry today. So how does that relate specifically to the construction industry? Well, some of the statistics on the slide here in front of you relating to construction are quite interesting to look at. One of them in particular, the largest burden of occupational cancer is in the construction industry. Over 40% of occupational cancer deaths and registrations this year were from people who had worked in the construction industry. So we're obviously still exposing people to things in their workplace that are causing them to have occupational cancer. This, these statistics are from um, the HSE 
and the uh, HC statistics that were printed in for the years 2013-14. So again, in the construction industry, look at the working days lost. 1.7 million of the 2.0 million were lost through health. So almost three quarters of lost time in construction is lost due to ill health rather than safety. So do we spend three quarters more of our time looking at health risk than we do at safety risk? Leave that one for you to think about. Why then is health such a unique challenge? In construction, we very often find that people will begin their lives as health and safety advisors and very quickly they will be called safety advisors. We tend to drop the H, we drop the health. And sometimes that's because it seems to us that it's more difficult to manage than safety. One of the reasons why it can seem more difficult is to do with what's called latency. To explain that, if you have a safety incident, for instance, someone falls off a ladder, you can immediately see what the problem was. Why are they using a ladder to get at what they're doing and it's not safe? They're, they immediately perhaps have, say, broken their leg and they can be sent to hospital and have that healed and you can look at a different way for them to access the height that they're getting to. If someone's being exposed to dust, for instance, silica dust, it may be five to ten years before we see the outcome, the health effect. And therefore, in our minds, we disconnect the exposure to the effect. And we tend to think of anything to do with health as being the domain of doctors and nurses, not something to do with health and safety necessarily. But really, looking at health and the management of health is quite simple. If you look at the picture on the screen on the right hand side, you'll see that there are a number of chains between pictures. So from the top one, we know that certain exposure to certain materials can cause dermatitis. We know that use of equipment that vibrates can cause hand-on vibration syndrome. We know that exposure to certain dusts will cause us to get cancers and respiratory problems. There is a definite link between exposure and outcome. All we need to do to manage health is to break the chain. No or less exposure equals no or less health outcome. If we want health to be more like safety, we need to have a strategic approach to what we're doing. Whenever we enter a project, we have a strategy we have our health and safety policies and procedures that we follow. The same needs to be said for occupational health, for it to be more like safety. Now, the strategic approach that Park Health uses and that has become quite popular in the construction industry is com something called the three W's strategy. To explain that, the picture on your screen on the right hand side is my favorite picture of occupational health. It's very, very simple. Dealing with occupational health, if you look at the bottom arrow, is all about the health of the worker when they arrive with you and during their stay, and what effect that will have on the work you're asking them to do. And then the top arrow is looking at the work that we're asking people to do, and what effect that could possibly have on their health. So the 3W strategy starts off with workplace, which is looking at where our biggest influence is. How can we reduce the impact of the work we're asking people to do on their health? It then looks at managing the impact of the person's health when they arrive and during their stay from a worker perspective on the work that we will be asking them to do. And the third W is well-being. How can we use the workplace to promote good health, thus making sure that that bottom arrow, their health, doesn't impact as much on the work we're asking them to do? 
Now, any procedures or processes based on this strategy will cover everything in occupational health. One problem we can have in construction with occupational health is that the occupational health team or the clinical team and the health and safety team can sometimes have a disconnect. The health and safety team are out there on site doing, looking at things on an everyday, day-to-day -day basis. And occupational health can sometimes only visit occasionally or be associated just with HR. The piece of the puzzle that's missing is occupational hygiene. Occupational health services that contain occupational hygienists make the connection between occupational health and health and safety much easier because occupational hygiene is still with the clinical aspect of ill health but also the day-to-day -day risk assessment of health and safety and they can be the connection between those two teams. What is an occupational hygienist? There is a good description on the screen in front of you of what an occupational hygienist is. Our skills are at preventing ill health and being able to anticipate where there may be problems. But our skills are also the skills that we would want everyone to have in construction looking at occupational health. We want to prevent ill health. We want to control exposures to things that can cause ill health. In order to do that, we need to evaluate how people are being exposed. We need to have the skills to recognize where those problems are. And we would like all to get to a point where we can anticipate from the design phase onwards where there are likely to be problems and make a difference. Occupational hygienists, when they're associated with your occupational health service, look at health risk assessment all the way through your program. They look from the design phase through risk assessments and method statements, looking at identifying, assessing and controlling on site and measuring exposures and linking what happens in your health and safety teams and your supervisors and things on site with what you need to do for occupational health and for good ill health prevention. Occupational hygienists can also do a lot of training to cover things that managers, supervisors, designers, operatives might need to know about how to control their own exposure to ill health. We're going to look at some of the impacts of work on health now in the construction industry. This first slide is my attempt at um, a computer generated game. According to my son, I don't play these games, when you come across something in a computer game that is going to hurt you, like a monster for instance, it affects your health bar. And the more your health bar goes down, the more likely you are to die in the game. The same is true of occupational health, ill health in construction. If you look at the picture in front of you, you've got someone cutting into a concrete slab and he's being exposed to a number of health risks. He's being exposed to the dust, which is going to affect his health. He's being exposed to hand-on vibration, which is going to affect his health. He's being exposed to noise, which is going to affect his health. He's being exposed to the sunlight, which can affect his skin. And he's also bending over in a very strange position there and that's going to affect his health and eventually after not very long doing this job this way it's game over for this man and he will not be able to stay in employment in construction we tend to throw personal protective equipment at people in this situation what I would suggest to you is the biggest thing to do is to ask the why question why is he doing this this way? Is there a way that we can design out the fact that he has to cut into this like this? Are there methods that we can give to control which can remove all these health effects? That's the way to make a difference in construction. The top five health impacts in construction from what you've seen on sites and on projects, the first two are from exposure to hazardous substances skin hazards and respiratory hazards. 
Then we have physical hazards like noise, hand-arm vibration, and musculoskeletal disorders. So we're going to look at a few of these impacts in the time that we've got here and see what the health effects are. Exposure to hazardous substances can cause skin problems, or what we call dermatitis. Skin problems or dermatitis can come in two forms. The most common is irritant contact dermatitis. So solvents, thinners, greases, oils, fuels can cause you to feel itchy and burny, which is what the, the picture on the right hand side is trying to show you. And it can damage the outer layers of your skin. But if you stop having contact, then you stop having the problem. The more problematic type of dermatitis is allergic contact dermatitis, which is caused by contact with a sensitizer, such as chromate, which is found in wet cement. It doesn't occur on first contact with the, pro with the particular material, but people become sensitized or allergic over a period of time of contact. It can occur within days, but it can also take months or years. Once you are sensitized to that material, you cannot go anywhere near it without having a very severe reaction on your skin. And it can cause your skin to continue to have that reaction over a period of time. Allergic contact dermatitis is one of the reasons why 10% of all bricklayers have to leave the industry every year. So we need to make sure that we're controlling people being exposed to hazardous substances. Another hazardous substance, an, another effect of hazardous substances, sorry, is respiratory disease. So things that we're going to breathe in and cause us a problem. And the biggie on the agenda for construction is being exposed to silica. Found in clay, slate, rock, in concrete, granite, curbs, sand, etc. Lots of things that we use in construction. In particular, exposure comes from um, cutting into concrete. Respirable crystalline silica can cause silicosis and can also cause lung cancer. And it only takes a very small amount to cause a problem. If we were measuring it in air, we'd be looking at 0.01 milligrams per metre cubed of air as being the maximum that someone can breathe in over a normal working day. If you look at the picture there, that's that amount of silica, which is on the right hand side, as opposed to the size of a penny. So a very small amount. We're going to watch a video now which tells you much better than I can what the health effects are of breathing in silica. Silica. It's one of the most common substances on Earth. It can be found in materials like sand and rock and building products like concrete and brick. When a worker cuts, grinds, or drills materials that contain silica, dangerous crystalline silica dust is released into the air. <coughs> As the worker breathes, silica crystals flow into his muck and down the air passages deep into the lungs. The tiny crystals enter the small, fragile air sacs where oxygen is absorbed into the blood. Immune system cells, called macrophages, engulf and try to dissolve the crystals, but they are unable to. Over time, more and more crystals build up inside the macrophage cells. The macrophages carry the silica into the walls of the lung, where they die. Our tissue forms around the dead cells and spreads as more cells die. This damage can continue even after the exposure to silica stops. Eventually, so much scar tissue forms that the lungs can no longer function. 
For information on how to protect yourself from silica exposure, visit WorkSafeBC.com. Okay, so that video is from WorkSafeBC.com. They have quite a quite a few good videos if you're using them for toolbox talks, but it's a good explanation of the problems that the lungs will have if you breathe in silica. Now, remember I said to you the maximum that you can breathe in on a working day is 0.01 milligrams per meter cubed. We're now going to look at someone who's cutting into a piece of concrete and the level will appear on the right hand side of the screen. You can see where the 0.1 is at the bottom. Just see how quickly he could be exposed if he wasn't wearing really good um, respiratory protection to more silica than he should be within his working shift. <laughs> So way above the limits there in just a few seconds of cutting into that concrete. If we look at control, it only takes some fairly simple controls to, com to reduce that level. Here is the same sort of action being done with water suppression. Okay, so can you see from the bar on the right hand side how how much longer it took for him to get above that level? And he only really goes above it when he's leaning down towards the cutting equipment at the last possible minute, which is probably because the reader is leaning down on the front of his shirt there. So by simple water suppression, we can make a big difference to the amount of silica that people are exposed to in the workplace. The next thing we're going to look at is noise. <clears throat> you can look at some of the um, statistics on the screen there about the number of workers who are exposed to noise between 80 and 85 decibels and above, which means that they are going to get problems. <clears throat> they will experience a gradual increasing loss of hearing from repeated exposure to loud noise. At first it can be temporary, but if it continues it can become irreversible. I'm going to let you watch a video now which is an explanation of how that happens. Let's take a look at the inside of an ear. Roll the computer graphics. If someone says, Hello. Hello? that sound enters my head through the ear canal and hits the eardrum which vibrates when the sound waves hit it. Behind the drum, in the middle ear cavity, are three tiny bones, the stirrup, the anvil, and the hammer. They vibrate too, and actually amplify the sound. They send the amplified sound vibrations to the cochlea, which looks sort of like a snail. The sound waves travel around and around inside the cochlea and bend over tiny nerve endings called hair cells, much like wind pushes around a field of grain. These hair cells are the ends of nerve cells, and the movement of the hair cells sends electrical signals to the brain. The brain decodes those signals, and I hear... So that's how our hearing works. But what happens when an ear is subjected to hazardous noise? Let's go back to those hair cells. If those hair cells get bent over to the point they can't spring back, that's when hearing loss occurs. 
It's like these blades of grass. Imagine they're the hair cells in your ears. Now, here comes a moderately loud sound wave. Not bad. The grass bounces back. But when the sound is extremely loud, the hair cells don't spring back. Extremely loud sounds can cause permanent damage. But so can moderately loud sounds if they continue over an extended period of time. Long exposures to moderately loud sounds can do just as much harm as one really loud sound. Both situations are hazardous. Fortunately, for the lawn, the grass will grow back or it can be replaced. Not so for your ears. The hair cells never grow back, ever, and they can't be replaced. So, how do you choose what hearing protection is best for you? What are the deciding factors concerning you and your job? Well, one consideration should be your current hearing ability. What? Also, your exposure to noise over the whole day. Your need to communicate on the job. Sit down. That'll make you look like I'm saying. Uh, who are you hitting? Oh, my God. <laughs> Other personal prayer. Okay. So that's quite a long video, which I suggest you could um, click the link to and see the rest of. But the important part of it was to show you exactly how loud sounds can affect your hearing. Not just in one loud sound at a time, but also if you are being exposed to moderately loud sounds over a period of time. And although it's concentrating on looking at what your hearing protection is, Really, we need to start thinking strategically about people's exposure to noise. So we not need to start thinking about how we can plan works so that less people are exposed to noise and how we can choose equipment that is less noisy. Those kinds of things are going to make the biggest difference to people's exposure to noise. The next thing on our list was hand-on vibration. Um, Hand-on vibration syndrome attacks your blood vessels, your nerves, can affect your muscles, bones and wrists. There are a lot of explanations there about what it does to your blood vessels, your nerves and your muscles and bones. None of which I'm going to read out to you because I'm sure that you will read them quite happily yourselves on the screen. When we're thinking about reducing hand-on vibration, we need to get, again, strategic. We need to look at things like remote equipment, things that people are not putting their hands on in the first place. We need to look at the levels of vibration that the kit that we are using will create. And we need to be clever about how we look at how people will swap from one piece of equipment to another and be exposed to hand-on vibration. And the last health effect that we were looking at was musculoskeletal disorders. So these are problems with m muscles and bones um, affected by what we call in safety manual handling, anything that's lifting or moving equipment on site. Highest rates for musculoskeletal disorders are in construction and agriculture because we do a lot of lifting and moving things. At the moment, we do a lot of training for people in manual handling. Strategically, I would suggest that we get more specific about how we're going to reduce the need for people to lift and move things themselves. So when we're looking at risk assessments and method statements, we need them to state exactly which part of the job could cause a musculoskeletal issue or a manual handling issue 
and then exactly what measures are going to be put into place for that part of the job to reduce the risk. The more specific we can be, the more strategic we're being in what we do. Think about the design of your site from the beginning. Where can materials be put so that less movement is needed? Now we said that there were three W's, so the other two W's other than the workplace, which is what we've been concentrating on, are the worker and well-being. And those things impact are, are the impact of a person's health when they arrive and during their stay on the work that we'll be asking them to do. This worker influence includes the gen what we generally term occupational health. So what we would recognize as clinical intervention from an occupational health point of view. One of the first things that is done, which is an industry, industry accepted practice on most sites, is to look at the health of people when they arrive with us. Now that can be done very simply on some sites by asking people to sign something to say they're fit for work. Not sure how I feel about that. By asking them to fill in a questionnaire about what their health problems are like. And in some cases, by doing medical checks on people who are safety critical. What do I mean by safety critical? There are two things which would deem someone as a safety critical worker. Number one is that if they were ill or uh, passed out while they were doing their job, they could affect a lot of people around them. So think about someone who's driving mobile plant or machinery. It could be a real problem for everyone else around them too if they pass out at the wheel, for instance. The second thing that can deem someone to be a safety critical worker is that by the nature of the environment they're in, it could be a problem to them and to the workers around them if they have a health problem. So think about people who are working on very busy highways or in confined spaces or places that are difficult to get them out of if they have a medical emergency. To show how important it is to look at how well people are in safety critical jobs, on the right hand side of the screen there are some pie charts. Now these are the results of the more than 10,000 safety critical medicals that were undertaken on the London 2012 Olympic site. The top pie chart shows you that of the 10,000 safety criticals, we found that a third of the people that we measured had a medical problem identified. The next one shows you that of those people, half of them were not aware that they had any medical problem at all. Now those medical problems were things like undiagnosed diabetes, undiagnosed high blood pressure, and in one case, someone who couldn't read the top line of an eye chart, but were um, using a crane. What we did was intervened with those people to help them to get back to work. So for, again, half of the people who had a new diagnosis, we put them on temporary restrictions. So we said for a little while, while we just get your blood pressure or your diabetes under control, you need to do something else. You need to work in the stores or do some other job than your safety critical job. And the last pie chart shows you how many people were permanently restricted from their jobs. And on the Olympic Park, that was about five or six who had health problems that we couldn't get under control so we can get them back to work. So safety critical medicals are important for your site from a health and from a safety point of view. But the purpose of them is to get people back to work, not to exclude people. If you're looking at clinical intervention, on some sites you're also looking at things like drug and alcohol testing. For larger sites, treatment services or emergency services to, to save lost site time. And you're also looking at health surveillance, which is a legal requirement. 
if we cannot reduce people's exposure to things like noise, dust and hand-on vibration to below a legal limit, then we have to give them health surveillance. So they have to be tested for, say, audiometry for their ears over a certain period of time. Spend on health surveillance can be quite a lot of money if we don't do it in the right and proper way. So what we need to do is do it from a risk perspective. We need to know how much a person is exposed to, reduce that to as low as possible, and then if it's not below the legal limit, we must do the legal health surveillance. So the more we can reduce people's exposure, the less health surveillance we need to do as a legal requirement. Interestingly, on that page talking about clinical interventions, most of the things we've talked about are industry accepted practices. The one thing that is a legal requirement is health surveillance. And how about well-being? Where does that fit in then? I am a, quite a new fan of well-being, I would say, over the last few years since my work on the Olympic Park. When we talked about T telling construction workers about how to improve their health. I imagined a bacon sandwich on a cold morning on a construction site and thought, we're not going to be telling people not to eat their bacon sandwiches. That's not going to go down well. I couldn't understand how encouraging people to be healthier in construction was going to work. But I became a fan because I saw two things. One, actually telling people about their own health outside of work helps them to become engaged with the process of health at work. So it engages them in the whole process of thinking about health risk management. And second of all, there is a crossover to safety. So I actually had a worker say to me that he had stopped a job one day. And I said, why did you stop the job? And he said, well, they were asking us to do something that was unsafe. And I said, well, that was a good thing to do, but why are you telling me? And he said, I'm telling you because the reason I did it is that I've been engaged with your well-being program. I've been doing lots of exercise and eating well, and my body is a temple. So I'm really important now. So I'm not going to do anything that's going to affect my health. So I could see immediately what the crossover was with safety. If you're doing well-being campaigns, think about how they will work best for you. On some sites, it's good to have monthly campaigns that people think about different health topics. On some sites, it can be quarterly themes because we don't have enough resource to put into monthly themes. They should always be something that's delivered as outreach, something you can go into the canteen and talk to people about, or you can give information out out about or you can actually run a fun competition with because that gets people involved. Think about things like lifestyle screening, health MOTs if you like. National campaigns on health are good to link in with and link it in with safety too. The poster that's on your screen came from the London 2012 project. We realised that we were having quite a lot of near misses happen between um, half past nine and eleven o'clock in the morning and we wondered why the near misses were peaking at that time. With a little investigation we found out that people weren't eating breakfast. They weren't eating breakfast because they couldn't afford to buy breakfast and buy lunch. So we ran a campaign on how important breakfast was and on providing porridge at a very cheap price, a pound a pot, throughout the site so that people could afford to have breakfast. It was called the London 2012 Big Breakfast Campaign and the poster was all about porridge, which will you will only understand if you're a certain age. But it was one of the most popular campaigns that we ran and it helped us to reduce our near miss statistics as well. So we've looked at a strategic approach to occupational health management in construction. We've only been able to touch very lightly on the subjects and I would say to you that it's really important because this is really going to affect your uh, workforce to look into this in a little more detail. 
you need to define what good looks like for you. If health is going to be like safety, we need to have it done in the same strategic way that safety is. Our procedures and our policies should include health in the same way. Think about the worker, workplace, well-being, 3W strategy. It works really well and has a proven track record. Risk management should drive the process of occupational health. It shouldn't be clinicians who tell us what we need. It should be us who know enough about it to tell the clinicians what we need. You should have access to occupational hygienists because they are your link between safety and occupational health. And we should know the difference between what's legally defined and we need and what is industry best practice or good to have. So health surveillance is a legal requirement. Wellbeing checks, um, fitness to work, they are good to have because they're good practice in the industry. A lot of these, this information is outlined in the new Cognac Guidance on Occupational Hill Health Risk Management in Construction. It's a very good document that's taken about five years of a, a group of um, Cognac a working group people put, to put together. And there is a link on the screen of where that's available. So that is the end of my presentation and time for me to look at any questions that we've got on the screen. I think we've got a few minutes now to see what people have been asking about. So I will attempt to go through these if I can. The first question on the screen is, will we get a copy of this presentation? And a copy of the presentation will be available on the IOSH website, I understand, and the information that goes with it. And you will be sent a link to that following the presentation. Next question is, may I know the statistics mentioned in the slides are related to the UK or are they related to other countries? So the statistics I first used were um, the 2 million people worldwide. They are international statistics um, for people's, the number of people who die as a result of their work. Um, the slides I then used about lost days were UK related. But you can get, if you're not UK based, you can find those statistics for your own country. Next question. The construction industry is, however, the largest employment sector. Um, there are about 2 million people in the UK who work in construction. So not sure that that's the largest sector might be a question that someone else will need to answer for us. Next question on my list is long, a uh, quite long and involved question. Ooh, disappeared. Um, from Lee about setting up health surveillance in construction. What I'm going to say is, at the moment, that's a very long question. Let's leave that one for a little bit later, or I may need to give you an answer to that in more detail. So, next question on my screen is, are there any free smart device apps that can help with reducing risks? Um, not being a fantastically technical person, for smart device apps. I'm not sure about that, but I'm sure if you look on the HSC website, um, you'd probably be able to find some links to any device apps that are out there. John is asking, do I take it that bacon sandwiches will be banned on the grounds of health and safety? No, definitely, definitely not. People need to have their breakfasts. Maybe start telling them to grill their bacon rather than frying it in lots of oil. Amy's asking, is there any intention to take into account ill health related to long working hours and fatigue or just vid or reportable? Um, I will say, Amy, that on all of our sites where we look at occupational health, we do also look at fatigue 
which includes long working hours. You need to have a fatigue management plan in the same way as you would be with health risks and um, look at how people work long hours but also how they travel to work because fatigue is a big and um, important sort of health risk in construction at the moment. Ralph asks, any reason why asbestos exposure was not mentioned? Um, asbestos is one of my pet subjects. I worked in the asbestos industry for years as a hygienist to begin with. Um, and asbestos is a whole topic in itself. So I think asbestos exposure is important for construction workers, obviously. There's a lot of information out there and it is a respiratory risk. But I think we would need a lot longer than the time that we were given if we wanted to touch on that as well. John asks, to what extent should the client principal contractor insist on doing their own health checks prior to contractors working on site versus asking contractors what their own systems are and relying on that? Um, I've worked in two different situations in construction. One is client funded occupational health where the client actually funds health checks themselves and um, funds what happens on site as far as occupational health is concerned and the other one is client led where the client insists that there should be those checks but doesn't leaves it to the contractors to do them what I would say is client funded works much better because you have some control over what happens um, if you do leave it to your contractors to do their own systems, what you need to make sure is that you've got a really good audit process that makes sure that those things are actually happening and that the people doing the auditing understand what they should be looking for. Next question, how to manage risks in the construction industry? Not really sure what you're asking there, Vinya. So, um, maybe that we need to not just highlight them in the presentation. Maybe you need another webinar on specific controls for specific risks. Would be good. How would you get the message through to the smaller construction workers? Harder to do, I think. The larger construction firms need to get it right first, is my answer to that. And then they need to pass it on down the chain. And we need to start looking at um, the subcontractors that we're taking on board and being able to check that they become approved suppliers because they have some access to um, occupational health. Simon's is asking, how can designers best affect the health opportunities for the workforce on the ground? Designers can have the biggest effect. If, if you design out, for instance, if you think about the, guy, the picture that we saw of the guy cutting into concrete, if he didn't have to cut into that concrete, if it was designed out or it was delivered to site pre-cut, you've cut out five potential health risks in one fell swoop. So it's really good. And I know that there is a group running at the moment uh, associated with the HSC, I think, which is looking into health in design. Um, if you want your designers to be interested in reducing occupational health and you have access to them, there is a very good book available online, which was created for Crossrail called Healthy by Design. And you can actually access that on the web and read it. And it's a very good uh, resource for designers. David Lloyd is asking, is your audience aware of the NHS Working Well Together partnership with employers? So I'm aware of that. I'm hoping that the audience is too. Uh, maybe people need to look at look that up on the web the working well together partnership with employers because that can help if you're a smaller contractor and you actually need to have some health undertaken on your site. 
Mark's asking how you can set up health surveillance when most employees are subcontractors. As a principal contractor, it is not your responsibility to make sure that people have had their legal health surveillance, but you would need to check, the HSC would expect you to check that your subcontractors have had that done if it's a legal requirement. Your biggest influence is to reduce the risk to a point where that legal health surveillance would not be required. Patrick is asking, what about construction in countries with malaria or the like? Um, it is a big question, Patrick, and you do have to, the same as in safety, you deal with the most significant risks first. We do work with an international firm um, looking at their occupational health strategy, um, not in construction, in manufacturing. And in some of the countries we go to, we need to concentrate on things like malaria risk first before we think about the risks in the workplace because they're not going to concentrate on reducing their risk to dust if they're more likely to die or be affected by malaria first so you do have to have deal with the most significant risks first in the same way that we do with safety <clears throat> I'm not very good at this. Um, okay, another question is, I'm currently faced with a concern on managing hand-on vibration for the workforce. I would appreciate any additional information that would assist with the process. In as much as the main means of reducing hand-on vibration syndrome is eliminating and reducing the time of exposure, how do you cater for long-term use and use of vibrating tools outside of work? Hmm. At Outside of work, you can only give them <coughs> information. We can't be telling people not to ride their motorbikes, etc. Um, inside of work, we need to be eliminating hand-on vibration wherever possible. So any kind of remote um, equipment that you can get, look carefully at what you're doing, look at the equipment and get the, the least vibrating equipment you possibly can. But elimination first, if there's anything that you can do differently, look at the design of what you need need to be doing. That's a, that's a situation where having access to an occupational hygienist would be fantastic because they can look at exactly what you're doing, what the measurements are for hand-on vibration and give you some really good control advice. Um, What's the difference between fatigue and stress? Okay, fatigue is extreme tiredness brought about by um, a combination of things like not having enough sleep and having too long a working day, and it can cause you to have stress after a while. Stress is having too much pressure over a long period of time. I hope that that has answered that one. It's quite a quick answer. Lots of questions here, so I'm trying to get through them in the amount of time. Um, again, another question about how, how to get the message through to smaller construction sites. Um, as a principal contractor, start doing the things right yourself. Get the principles in place first yourselves, and then pass over the information and learning to people. People have to learn how to do the right thing. What effect will it have on an operative if he is put on night shifts for a long time, say a year or so? Um, Nessa, that's quite, again, quite a, a very specific question. There are um, fatigue issues with long-term night shifts. Um, from a fatigue point of view, though, sometimes it can be worse to be swapping between shifts rather than to be on one set shift. So it's maybe a question you need to ask your own occupational health provider with the uh, information, more detailed information about the shift pattern. 
Andrew asks about work-related stress. Again, that's another pet topic of mine. Um, if you look at the statistics in construction, the statistics will tell you that stress is not a big issue in construction. I would suggest that the reason for that is that people who work in construction are a little bit macho and don't want to admit to the fact that they have stress. Um, but stress is a big topic with the HSE at the moment and particularly with the Cognac Health Working Group looking at construction. So I think that we will get to see a lot of information about workplace stress and construction in the next few months. Someone else asking about eliminating hand-on vibration and exposure. Again, what I would say is that's a question for an occupational hygienist. Get your occupational hygienist involved with anything to do with hand-on vibration because they'll be able to give you some fantastic information about the control of hand-on vibration and about elimination. Someone else asking any reason why stress wasn't mentioned. Um, time restraints, again, stress is a whole other big issue that needs a little bit more time to talk about. But there will be information coming out from HSC about stress and construction, I think, very soon. Quite a lot of people saying um, mention of stress. Badly recognised in the industry. I would agree with you. I do a lot of stress management um, measurement on construction sites. And I can tell you it definitely is a problem. And more about workplace stress issues. So definitely, I'm going to go back to my working group at HSE and say we are on the right track here with stress and construction because it's definitely a topic that people are interested in. Kirsty asking, do you think SSIP accreditation will become mandatory? And that may help. Um, not sure if that would help. SSIP, I'm, I'm like racking my brains. Um, I'm going to leave that one, I think, and, I, and get that answered later because it's may take a little time. There's again someone else. There's no mention of stress. Something badly recognised in the industry. And for that again, it is definitely badly recognised in the industry. Can we have the link to IOSH or SHP articles? That highlight what health issues large projects have identified. Yes, there is some articles that have been produced, in particular in relation to London 2012, and I can supply those with the information that goes out with the webinar. Uh, someone else asking about a um, program to measure hand-on vibration. Again, Speak to a hygienist. Really, really good to speak to a hygienist on those questions. He's asking how long you'd recommend running the program before the data is of value. Look at reduction first because long term um, exposure to vibration is not good. I think we have come to the end of my time to be able to answer questions. I know there are lots of them. Um, I understand that I will have the ability to. Um, answer some of the other questions and they will get sent out to you as part of the presentation. Thank you very much for everyone who joined this afternoon and for your interest in the presentation.